Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to talk again to Adnan Rashid. You're most welcome, sir. Thank you very much for having me again, Paul. Paul Pleasure. For those who don't know, Adnan is a historian, a numismatist, uh, traveler, human rights activist, author, supporter of justice and peace, and a bibliophile. Uh, we share that last condition. Um, and you can follow him on Twitter at Mr. Adnan Rashid, MR, uh, Adnan Rashid. And um, as you might know, Adnan has a popular and regularly updated YouTube channel where, for example, you can see his recent thoughts about Andrew Tate accepting Islam. Now, it's a beautiful message, and I'll link to it in the description below. Today, Adnan has kindly agreed to discuss history in nine amazing coins, and this promises to be a real treat. So over to you, sir. Thank you for having me, Paul, once again to address your followers and your audiences. Uh, why are we discussing coins? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Coins are um, very, very important historical, um, basically historical objects. And coins can tell us so many stories, so many things. People generally don't focus on coins. They don't, they don't think about coins as uh, sources of uh, history. So mm -hmm. coins are one of the most important sources of learning history, studying history, knowing the past and how people lived, what their cultures were, what their languages were, uh, what the state of the economies was. All these questions can be answered by looking at coins. For example, uh, you can tell by looking at coins as to how prosperous a civilization may have been. Mm. Right. If the quantity of gold is good in, uh, let's say, coins coming from a particular dynasty in the past, then that means that uh, particular dynasty or that civilization had access to plenty of gold. Mm. Likewise, likewise, um, if you see the quantity of gold decline, if you see the standard of gold decline, then you can see that this civilization was financially, economically struggling. Mm -hmm. They had to reduce the quantity of gold in the coins, likewise silver and other metals. So by looking at metals or the quantity of the metals uh, in uh, a given set of coinage that was uh, produced by a particular dynasty in the past, you can tell how prosperous, how economically successful uh, mm -hmm. that particular dynasty was. So that's why studying coins can tell you so many things. It can teach you so many things about the culture, about the language, about uh, the religion, for that matter, of the people of the past. And we will see today uh, what I mean by that. Okay, mm. we will see when we look at these coins in in a rough, um, you know, rough chronological order. Because I'm not discussing every single dynasty. Uh, that came in between the, the the earliest and the and the latest coin I will be discussing tonight, but I will try to put these coins in a chronological order so that our audiences can actually understand why yeah. these yeah. coins are important and what we can learn from them. So let's get cracking straight away. Uh, the first coin I have in my uh, hand here is Ooh. is basically from Athens. Okay, I'm gonna try to turn it. So that you can oh, see oh, it. There we are. I can see. I can see a profile of a, a lady's uh, face. I think a profile. Exactly. So that's Athena. That's Athena. Athena. Mm -hmm. So this coin is from about 450 BC. Wow. Before Christ. This mm -hmm. is 450 years before be before Jesus Christ was born. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's nearly 2,500 years. This coin is uh, that old. So what you see here, the face of Athena. Uh, this coin was minted at Athens. Okay, and well, so that that coin could have actually been used or touched by Plato, who was alive at roughly that time, I think, in Athens in ancient Greece. Exactly, you got yeah. it right. You got it right. Plato, yeah. Socrates, yeah. who knows? Aristotle, uh, yeah. Aristotle later on. Absolutely, absolutely, mm -hmm. no doubt. So this is yes. I mean, thank you for pointing that out, Paul. That's a very important caveat we have to add. Right. This is what Plato. Socrates and Plato would have used because Socrates was a, was the teacher of Plato. Yeah. Plato, the man who famously authored his Republic, a very yeah. famous book. Which I'm reading at the moment, by the way. It's an extraordinary book, but anyway, that's a different. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's the coin uh, Plato would have used. I mean, it's, it's good to wow. attach these coins to personalities when people can better appreciate them. So yeah. you see the face of Athena, the goddess, I mean, the alleged goddess of the, the Greeks, <laughs> Athena. Yes. Okay. Uh, and on the other side, when you turn the coin around, you will be looking at the pictures of these coins. Ah, is that that's uh, an owl? Because an owl, see an owl, yeah, you see an owl. Okay, and you see a you see an olive branch. You see a small crescent, mm -hmm. and then you see the Greek alphabets, alpha. Oh. Okay, omega. Oh, is that omega? I can see as well. Uh, yeah, alpha, theta, epsilon. Oh, okay? epsilon. Yeah. So when you read it together, it makes athi, athi. Athi, okay. as in Athens, as in Athens. Athi stands for Athens, basically, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's a very uh, nice specimen. Uh, it is the earliest coin I possess in, wow. in my humble collection. And uh, it is in silver. It's about 16 grams of silver. It is called tetradram. Tetradram stands for four drams. Drams is basically later on what we call the dirham. The mm. term dirham actually originates from the term, the Greek term, dram. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so this is tetradram. Each drum was approximately four grams of silver. Okay, in this period and mm -hmm. even later on. So tetradram means four drums, and this is 16 grams of silver, or approximately between 16 to, 16 to 17 grams of silver. Wow. So this is an early coin, and this is regarded as one of the earliest coins in human history. I mean, yeah, yeah. coins coins were invented or introduced. Uh, a century before this coin was um, minted, about 6th century BC, um, coins were introduced in uh, Lydia. There's a place called Lydia in current day Turkey where coins were minted. First mm -hmm. coins as a form of currency were minted in a place called Lydia. Okay, mm -hmm. and that was the 6th century BC. Okay, so about a, a century before this particular coin, you can see in my hand right now. I mean, do, do you have any sense of the uh, the circulation of these coins? I mean, would they have been used by ordinary people in the market, for example, to buy and sell produce, or would they have been much more restricted to um, more elite kind of exchanges, kind of symbolically exchanging goods? I mean, just how ubiquitous were they in in the economy of Athens? Do you think? No, that's a very good question. You see, this coin was the dollar of the day. In the ancient world it wasn't only used at the time of plato and socrates but rather even later on this was an accepted currency for wow. centuries we're talking about two three hundred years after these mm. coins were minted because mm. the the quantity of silver was so good uh, for some reason there was an explosion of greek coinage at this time that's why the greeks started to experiment on coins uh, and some of the greek coins when you look at them they are so beautiful they are so amazing there is such amazing artwork on them mm -hmm. one one is baffled simply blown away by the sheer beauty of the uh, artwork on these coins uh, mm -hmm. some of those coins were minted uh, in current day sicily for example which was also part of the greek civilization at the time yeah. right uh, i think it was called syracuse some of the best coins were minted in sicily uh, in the 5th century BC or, or the 4th century BC. So, so the Greeks pioneered uh, die making. So this is a die struck coin. This is a die made of uh, iron or bronze, okay, that struck this particular coin. So how would they strike these coins? They would have uh, pieces of silver weighed for the right uh, amount of silver for for the right weight for let's say 16 to 17 grams they would make it round like this one looks and then they would put place it between this piece of silver they would warm it they would warm it and they would place it between two dies and they would hammer so mm. both sides would be inscribed with what you see on the coins there the mm -hmm. owl Mm. the olive branch the small crescent and the alphabets athi okay and on the other hand you see on the other side this is basically obvious this is obvious with the face of athena okay uh here i think you can see it clearly now yeah yeah, right. yeah, yeah okay yeah, yeah. this is the obvious and this is the reverse this right. is what we call reverse yeah. this is right? not a yeah, portrait of any uh historical person this is, athena was a greek god of course so, yeah uh, and and the the owl symbolized Athens and also symbolized wisdom actually in Greek philosophy it was it, it had had kind of several meanings I think absolutely absolutely so so the reason why there was an explosion of silver coinage at this time in the mid fifth century uh, in Athens was because the Greeks had discovered silver mines okay 
uh, and uh, there was a lot of silver there was plenty of silver so these coins are minted in hundreds of thousands uh, and they are easy to easy to get hold of they are costly they are pricey but you can still get them uh, from good coin experts and coin dealers who can give yeah. you a guarantee of originality okay. so to go to Sotheby's here in London and and uh, see this on sale um, what would I, what would I be expecting to to cough up to uh, to purchase one of these amazing coins do you think yeah this particular one the one you saw there it could be anywhere between a thousand pounds to three thousand pounds depending on the condition and right. how good how good the the state of the coin is if it's, it's if it's used if it's uh if it looks used and it's, it's, it's the surface is smooth then it it kind of you know it, it's cheaper but yeah. if it's mint condition and it's, it's been found with a hoard that hasn't been used it was wow. stored somewhere and found later on and it's in good condition those coins can go for high prices depending on the condition how good the condition is right mm -hmm. so yeah. that's the one of the earliest coins uh, I have here in front of us, which could have been used possibly by Socrates or Plato, right? Absolutely. Next coin I have is also a, a something very, very interesting. Okay, this yeah. one is a coin minted at during the reign of Philip II, the ah. father of Alexa Alexander the Great. Sorry, I dropped it. Alexander the Great, of course, the, uh, the great spread of Hellenism and Greek uh, culture and. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. military might spread throughout the world and that's his dad Alexander the Great's father is it exactly but oh, this is this the depiction is of Heracles this ah. is this is a young head of Heracles again Greek mythology uh, a Greek mythical figure who mm. was seen to be uh, a very important figure in uh, Greek mythology so you can see his bust uh, or his effigy depicted on the coin so this is Heracles very nicely struck coin with a very clearly defined bid very good condition isn't it I mean the, the, the all, all the contours of the portrait are intact I think they haven't been rubbed away by constant use anyway exactly exactly and this coin was minted somewhere around 360 BC between 360 to 336 BC when um, uh, Philip himself was alive Philip the second right so this yeah. is the father a father of Alexander the Great. His name is actually inscribed on the back of the coin in Greek, Philippoi. I don't know if you can see it. There's a young man on a horse, riding yeah. a horse. Okay. And yeah. on top of the young man, on top of the young man, you see the Greek alphabets. Okay. And it's clearly written Philippoi. Philippoi. Uh, yeah. Philip, Philip, Philippoi is basically Philip, the, the yeah. fa father of Alexander the Great. It's very clearly inscribed there. And this coin was struck at his capital called Amphip uh, Amphipolis. Amphipolis was in Macedonia, and that was the capital of Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great. Okay, again, this is, uh, we're looking at the time of Aristotle now. Okay, we have looked at okay, a coin okay. from mm -hmm. the time of Socrates and Plato. Now we're looking at a coin yeah. from the time of Aristotle when Aristotle was alive walking around. Okay. And Aristotle, of course, taught Alexander the Great. He was a tutor to Alexander the Great for a time before Alexander went off on his campaigns. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I mentioned this before. In the West, uh, in Europe, uh, Alexander is known as Alexander the Great. And what did he do? He went out conquering uh, um, whole peoples and empires. He went thousands of miles to the east, even as far as what's today called India. But of course, there's a certain other person um, upon whom BPs who was also you know, not given this title in the West. But Alexandra is, and it gets to show the double standards, perhaps, that are utilized in the West, that we can just praise someone who was a conqueror, who took over societies. And yet someone who brought liberation, enlightenment, is simply not accorded that honor, even that little honor. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, it's, 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 it, it, things do, uh, unfortunately, appear in history like that uh, but alexander in terms of his uh, territorial expansion his geographical mm -hmm. achievements he was the great i would yeah. say that. in 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 human terms i mean we don't we don't mean the great or the ultimately great of course we don't mean that but mm -hmm. he did achieve great things in terms of uh, territorial expansion and the kind of people he fought he, he defeated the the persian emperor at the time uh, uh, darius okay who was uh, from the Achaemenid Empire, uh, and then he took Persian territory, he took the capital Babylon, okay, and then he went as far as India. This was phenomenal, phenomenal yeah. achievement, uh, especially when you you are a young man, 
Alexander. He died young. He didn't die an old man. He died uh, young, of course. 33 years old. 33 mm. years old. He started in 336 BC and he finished um, in 323 BC. So he went on for 13 years. In, in 13 years from Macedonia to India and then mm. back to Babylon where he died. This was a phenomenal achievement yeah. at that time and in, in, in that day and age. He even went to Egypt. He conquered Egypt and then he made his way towards Persia and India. So no doubt in that sense, in, in I mean, if you were to look at his territorial expansion, he did achieve great things, right? Mm -hmm. not, necessar not necessarily morally or in terms of, uh, and you know what? Uh, to this day, his expansion has a role to play, how, how history is formed, how things happen later on. He has a huge influence on uh, our history. So he will never be forgotten for that no. purpose. No. And uh, now that you mention him, this is uh, his coin. This is one of his coins. And wow. it's a very beautiful specimen. If you look uh, carefully, this is Heracles wearing uh, a lion skin on the head. Oh, okay. it was, yeah. That's, that's and, strange, and, strange headgear. I'm not sure I'd wear that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is Heracles wearing a lion skin. And it is claimed that this was uh, a likeness of Alexander himself. Ah. Alexander looks something like this. Mm. Some scholars claim that although it is Heracles being depicted on the coin, again, this is again a tet tetradram, about 16 to 17 grams of silver. This is a tetradram, four mm. drams, okay? A very heavy, solid coin with good silver content, uh, okay? So e even though this is Heracles being depicted, but Alexander wanted to show himself as Heracles himself, okay? Yeah. Uh, in uh, maybe divine in some sense. So mm. this is Heracles wearing lion skin and maybe Alexander looked like that. On on the other hand, we see Zeus, uh, oh. okay, another mythical figure from Greek mythology, Zeus sitting on a chair or a throne, okay, with an eagle, with an eagle in his hand. Okay, you can see that clearly. You can even see his six packs. This is how clearly he's depicted. <laughs> you can see yeah. his six packs. Yeah, you can, you can even... Seriously, if you if you I mean when you see the magnified image on the screen which you may be seeing oh, right yeah. now, look yeah. at his six packs. There is <laughs> an eagle. He, he's carrying an eagle and he's uh, he's uh, holding this uh, staff. <laughs> we come from, we come from a, a, an owl, the symbol of Athens, a great Greek culture, wisdom, philosophy too. An eagle. So what does eagle? What does the eagle signify in this change? Do you think? I I I actually don't, that's a very good question. I haven't looked into this, but hmm. uh, eagle was used later on by Romans as well yeah. as a symbol. Uh, for the Roman Empire, the but, imperial singer of, of God, this is sovereign majesty, this great bird, yes. so high above the earth, unaffected by. Yeah, I can see the symbolism there. Yeah, yeah. So I'm assuming this this uh, is some sort of uh, symbol for um, uh, for victory, or eagle is a sacred bird. I don't know. I don't know the act uh, the significance okay. of eagle on these coins, but it is eagle depicted on uh, Apollo's. Uh, sorry, Zeus. Zeus. Zeus is one hand, and then yeah. we have uh, the mint mark under the chair. When you see Zeus sitting, and there is a circle underneath on the uh, inside the chair, and mm -hmm. that circle signifies the mint mark where the coin was actually minted, and that's Tarsus, current oh, day Turkey. Okay, now, of course, Tarsus became very famous for someone else in history. <laughs> exactly, Paul of Tarsus or Saul of Tarsus. Okay, yeah. so this coin was minted in Tarsus, the city of Tarsus, a very good specimen. And amazingly, just behind uh, Zeus, you can see some writing in Greek, right? That's the name of Alexander. It, it is written in the Greek language, Alexandroi, Alexandroi. Underneath the chair, uh, the text is cut. It says Basilios. Basilios means king in yeah. the Greek language. So it says Basilios Alexandroi. Okay, so this is a very interest, interesting specimen from the reign of Alexander the Great, who ruled from 336 to 323 BC. Okay, about 13 years. Okay, now, I, I mean, I just want to quickly add this coin as a complimentary uh, piece for you to look at, even though it's not part of my uh, collection I was going to share with you today, but this is Alexander's coin minted at Babylon. Uh, this oh, is well. where he died. So again, you see Zeus sitting on a chair yeah. Yeah. with an eagle, and yeah. underneath the chair, you see a sheath. You see a sheath of flowers or something like that. Yeah, That's yeah. the mint mark for Babylon. This coin was minted in Babylon when Alexander had taken Babylon, right? Yeah. And it is now historically 
known that Alexander actually died in Babylon. He died right. in Babylon, having returned from India. So this is a very important piece of information that must be remembered. So it is Alexander, uh, um, basically the head of Heracles on one side, and Zeus seated on the other side, uh, on the obverse. Moving on, when, uh, when Alexander died, we know his empire was split into uh, at least four pieces. Mm -hmm. ruled by governors who were companions, once upon a time, companions of Alexander yeah. the Great. Okay, yeah. so Bactria went to Seleucus, okay, one of his generals. Uh, uh, current day Turkey went to Lysimachus, another general, and Egypt went to Ptolemy. Uh -huh, uh, so. Then this is where we got Ptolemaic Egypt, and Cleopatra later on was to marry one of the descendants of this very uh, Ptolemy. Cleopatra is a very famous figure, historically speaking. So she married one of the descendants of Ptolemy. Actually, it's claimed that she was a mix from the Egyptians and the Ptolemies, right, the, from this very family. And then we had Macedonia ruled by initially one of the sons of Alexander, and then he was killed and then uh, later successors. So this coin is the reason why many people started to assume that Alexander was Vulkarnain of the Quran including some Muslim scholars, they mistakenly claimed that Alexander was the Dhulkarnain of the Quran because on yeah. this coin, Alexander is depicted wearing two horns, mm -hmm. horns of Amon. Amon oh. was an Egyptian god. Alexander, when he conquered Egypt, he went into the desert to find the oracle. The oracle basically was a place where people could get, um, how can I put it? Um, uh, Oracle was a place where you would find priests who would interpret your dreams and they would tell you about the future. Okay, they would do some rituals and they would tell you what, what the future holds for you. So Alexander, to find the Oracle, went into the desert and found this temple of Amon in the middle of Egyptian desert. Okay, it was wow. a very tough, difficult journey. And then Alexander became a devotee of Amon. Okay, Amon or Amon, uh, an Egyptian deity. And then as a devotee, he put these horns on his head, two horns. Uh, so you see the depiction of the horn. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, Paul, clearly. Can you yes, see it? I, I, I can. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. very, it's very yeah. clearly defined, right? Yeah, you yeah, see yeah. his hair, very nicely defined. And then you see the horn, okay, the yeah. cuts yeah. of the horn. So uh, so he was basically, Dhulkarnain literally means the one with two horns, right? So people started to assume, some Muslim scholars, that uh, that could be Alexander. But then Alexander, we know, was a pagan. He was an idol worshipper. Ali, I think, in his, com in his com commentary, mentions that uh, claim, I think. Yes, exactly. And that's, yeah. that's an error. That's an error. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because Dhulkarnain was a believer. The Quran tells us he was a prehistoric king. He yeah. lived in the prehistoric period and he was a believer so alexander was clearly not uh, no, a believer in one, yeah, yeah. and and he was a devotee so so you see athena sitting here with a shield on the other side of the coin you see athena with a shield okay with nike in one of her hands or about nike one of is interesting because th th this word nike of course is a, a trademark today i think does it not mean victory in greek uh, yeah she's the nike is the god goddess of war if i'm not mistaken right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or I, if uh, I actually, I'm not too sure, but uh, either Athena or Nike, one of these two is uh, the goddess of war. So you see Athena seated with a shield, with a, with a spear, mm -hmm. very clearly defined. And mm -hmm. then you see Nike on top of her hand. And then you see the Greek text in front of Athena that states the name of the king, Lysimachoi. Lysimachoi is the, the, the governor, Lysimachus, who succeeded Alexander. Well, what's, well, what's interesting, that coin is, uh, I, actually, I, I remember uh, as a kid, some of the old, the old coins from uh, the early 20th century and the 19th century in England actually had a, quite a similar design. You had a, a, a kind of woman seated with a shield, Britannia, of Britannia, course. Britannia, absolutely. Uh, it, it seems there's a conscious echo there of, of, of ancient uh, coin depiction, I think. Interesting. Yeah, I think this is the coin you're talking about. I have it here. This is King George. His, this is King George Penny from 1799. This right. is a penny from 1799. There you have King George. Sorry, let me let me it's bring it up. Yeah, up. I can't see it. Okay, sorry, one second. Can you see? Mm, not. 
Oh, I, I can see the head now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's King George. Right. Okay, this yeah. is the penny from 1799, and wow. this is Britannia on the back depicted. Ah, ah, now yes, exa that's exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah, and and actually, uh, quite a while after that, a similar kind of style. On yeah, the even coins. even yeah. even Victorian coins, even yeah, yeah, Queen yeah. Victoria, even Queen Victoria's coins have the same depiction: Britannica sitting with the shield with Union yeah. with the Union Jack yes. uh, and a spear. So the design is actually borrowed from these ancient uh, coins. Uh, conscious imitation of ancient Greek uh, style, and not just the coinage, in, in many other ways as well, of course. Absolutely absolutely so now moving on fast mm. forward to the romans i have a coin from constantine the great okay wow. this is yeah. uh this is my goodness me uh, uh yes. this is a copper uh, phyllis okay uh of uh constantine you right. you'll probably be looking at a better image of this coin uh, yeah high resolution coin but i am trying i'm struggling so that you can see it as well yeah, it's very yeah. to, to get the it's a very little coin, isn't it, compared to the? Uh, it's, it's a little coin. You see, oh, sorry, okay. You see uh, the depiction of uh, Constantine there. So this is Constantine, Constantine the, the Great. Uh, yeah. Who, uh, he, who, of course, the Nicene uh, Council of Nicaea, which led to the calling Jesus God uh, unambiguously, and he, he was the, the, the Roman Empire, the whole of the Roman Empire. He unified. He attempted to unify the whole of the Roman Empire. Correct. And wow. and what's interesting about this coin is that on the other side, you see uh, uh, his the deity he, he was worshipping, Saul Invictus, the sun right. god. Okay. Yes. So here you see Saul Invictus oh. uh, depicted with sun in one hand and the text states Soli Invicto Comity. Soli wow. Invicto Comity, basically. So this is Saul Invictus depicted on the other side uh, because Constantine was a devotee of the of sun god and this is how we got our sunday okay mm. sunday was the day when sun god was obviously uh, worshipped specially and uh, 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 even christmas the 25th of december was mm. the day of the sun god who was worshipped uh, like it was a feast day and then the christian uh, uh, leadership at the time in the fourth century they decided that instead of celebrating the day for jesus christ uh on the first of january we should all do it on the 25th of december to unite the roman pagans or bring them closer to christian christianity we should do we should move our day from the first of january to the 25th which was the day of the sun god right mm -hmm. so this is the historic context or historical context here on the coin uh, constantine himself was a devotee of sun god basically right and he's depicted on the coin now moving fast forward very quickly because our time is running out um um we i have something very interesting uh coming to the islamic period when muslims took uh, much of uh, the roman and, and the persian territory uh, they were faced with a challenge and the ch that challenge was uh, the economic condition of the people okay how do we handle the the economies of these territories mm. okay the byzantines had left behind the gold solidus based economy okay which was this coin you can see it very quickly okay this is a gold solidus of the byzantines wow. you can see the emperor uh, depicted on the coin right so wow. this is this is an emperor depicted on the coin uh, this is emperor constance who was a contemporary of uthman radiallahu on the third caliph of islam he was a contemporary of uh, Uthman. So you yeah. see Christian symbolism on this. You see a cross on the other side. Okay, you can oh, see yeah. the cross clearly depicted. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can see the cross. Okay, so this was the gold solidus, and then on the other hand, the Persians had uh, the economy based on uh, this uh, Persian drum. Okay, uh, yeah. which was about four grams of silver, right? So the Muslims are facing the situation that how do we how do they deal with the Persian economy on the one hand and the, the Byzantine economy? So they, they didn't change anything initially. They were very pragmatic, very yeah. practical about things. So the Sahaba and their successors, when they came to power in these territories, they kept the same currency. They did yeah. not try to change the economic order of the day. So the markets kept flourishing and they actually prospered. So the Byzantine solidus was adopted in uh, Roman territory, current day Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon, and Egypt, and much of North Africa, 
mm. and then the Persian silver drum was adopted in Persian territory. So Persian economies continued as normal as they were in the past. So slowly Muslims started to add their religious symbols on the coins. They didn't change the coinage. The drum remained the same. The solidus was coming from the, the Romans. Muslims were selling commodities to the Romans. In return, mm. they were getting these gold solidus, right? But what happened in the case of solidus is that when Muslims were selling papyri, which was necessary for Byzantine administration, papyri was used as paper at the time, as you mm. might know, Paul. Uh, mm. Paper wasn't yet invented. It was invented in China, no doubt, China, but yeah. it wasn't made universally available in the world. So, it's the Muslim world, world had apparently had paper, used paper, far, far uh, before Europe ever encountered paper. So, um, uh, Europe was paperless for, for quite some time. Yeah, so that's mm. why you see all documents written, all important religious documents mm. written on vellum, mm. on skin, on leather. It's Likewise, right. Same was the case in the Roman world, in the Byzantine territory. Uh, the only cheap form of paper uh, at that time was papyri that mm. came from Egypt. Okay, and Muslims had taken Egypt. So now the Romans, the Byzantines had to buy papyri from Muslims. Mm. So the Muslims were adding Islamic formulas as letterheads to this paper. So they would write something like Muhammad Rasulullah, Muhammad the Messenger of God. So mm. the Byzantines were not happy about that. So they complained to the Muslims that if you don't stop putting your religious formulas on this paper, papyri you sell to us, we're going to start putting insults against your prophet mm. on our solidus. The solidus, the solidus we sent to you as a payment, you're not going to like what you find on them. For that yeah. reason, Abdul Malik bin Marwan, who was the caliph at the time, we're talking about 70s, 70s, uh, the decade of 70s Hijri, after Hijra, right? Yeah. So uh, he, he's advised by his advisors. Some claim it was Hajjad bin Yusuf, others claim it was uh, Khalid bin Yazid, one of the sons of Yazid and other uh, individuals at the court. They advised him that why don't we use these solidus, melt them and mint our own currency. Oh. So Abdul Malik bin Marwan decided to experiment with a new dinar, with new weight, which was about 4.25 uh, uh, gold in weight. And this is what came up as a result. Go. This is one of the first, one of the earliest dinars in Islamic history. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the first one was minted. The first fully Islamic dinar was minted in the year 77 AH after Hijri or the year 77 of Islam. Okay, this one in my hand is from the very next year, the wow. year 78, okay? Uh, so I basically, you can see, uh, I don't know if you can read it clearly, but it has, um, if you look at, let me, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but you will be looking at an image, a high resolution image. Uh, you're looking at it. If you read anti-clockwise, it says, Bismillah, Dureba, Hadha dinar fi sana thaman wa sabain. In the name of Allah, this dinar was struck in the year 78. And in the center, you see Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, Lam Yalid, wa Lam Yulad. I say that that's the 112th surah of the Quran, surah uh, Iqlas, of course. Uh, exactly. Uh, so the you can see um, of God and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can see that the surah is inscribed on a dinar from the year 78 Hijri when some of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad were alive. We yes. have multiple, multiple companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, alive, including Anas bin Malik, the famous Anas bin Malik, one of the young servants of the Prophet وسلم, who narrated tons of reports from the Prophet, peace be upon him, because he died. <laughs> This is seriously early. I mean, this is actual tangible artifacts from the time of the the Sahaba themselves. Yes. Uh, and what's interesting, I I've noticed that all the coins you've shown up till now have had human features on. They've had portraits, they've had gods, goddesses, or they've had human figures like Alexander. Now, for the first time, we're coming across coinage without any kind of 
uh, physical uh, manifestations at all. No, no portraits, no deities, no pictures, nothing. It's just pure language. It's the language of the Quran mostly. So this is a, this is a kind of revolution in the illustration of coins, isn't it? The partic particularly Islamically uh, illustrating the coins. Absolutely, absolutely. And and Muslim coins, Islamic coins, were to remain on this model for the next uh, four to five hundred years until the Seljuks started to put imagery on coins really? later right uh, okay. Seljuks of Rome in particular okay we start to see some images uh, of people or human beings on coins from that period I mean animals were put on coins no doubt animals were put on coins for design for beauty and things like that during the Abbasid period no doubt but this was to remain the standard model right. uh, uh, succeeding Muslim dynasties would use same chapters of the Quran Surah Ikhlas 112 same right. verse anti-clockwise on the obverse where we have i mean uh, i forgot to show you the obverse because you saw the reverse uh okay the obverse has the shahada okay uh, on it you can see here it says in the center in the center it says la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la okay i don't know if it's clearly visible but mm -hmm. then if you read anti-clockwise it has a verse of the quran taken from chapter 9 verse 33 Muhammad Rasulullah arsalahu bil huda wa deen al haq li yudhirahu ala deen kulli wa law karihal mushrikun. So that verse basically means Muhammad, the Prophet of God, who has been sent with guidance and the, 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 the true way, and this way will dominate all other ways uh, in the future. So this is, this is like uh, a declaration from Abdul Malik bin Marwan and his entourage or his followers mm -hmm. or his, uh, let's say, empire that. Uh, now we don't need the Byzantine solidus with with all that Christian symbolism and amazingly uh, One may question why did they choose? Ch chapter 112 uh, mm. in particular for this coin and Not many people know this. This was a direct response to Christian theology. Uh, I guess that yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely so, so, Yeah, so mm. so the Christians the Byzantines are putting a cross mm. on their solidus, their gold solidus, as you saw earlier, right? So the cross basically denotes the life of Jesus Christ or his death on the cross, for example, and the cross is a symbol of Christianity. So in response, the Muslims put uh, the Quranic response to Christian theology on their coins, which is what? Say, God is one. He's not three. He's not a trinity. He's not three in one. He is one. He is neither begotten nor does he beget. Right, yeah. it does not beget, he's not begotten, so that's again a direct response to Christian theology. And yeah. there's no one like him, don't liken him to human beings, yeah. don't see human beings in him, and yeah. vice versa. Okay, or don't see God in human beings, right? So, there is no one like him. So, this is a very powerful response to mm. the yeah. Christian theology, which was being depicted on the coins of the Byzantines with the emperor on one side carrying mm. a cross. And the other side, you see a cross and the name of the emperor. So mm -hmm. this was so the the Muslim dinar was a direct response to gold solidus. So you see, Paul, how much history coins tell, how much one can actually uh, learn from coins, looking at what is being depicted, the language, the culture, uh, the religious. But, 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 but what I know is that you're, you're sitting in London as I am, and you actually have. A physical artifact, some uh, actual tangible material substance from the time of the Sahaba. The Sahaba themselves might have touched coinage itself, and this is a certain extraordinary physical link just between you now and the time of the Sahaba. You know, 1,400, 1,300 years ago, and that that itself is really impressive. It's not just about ideas; it's about real, real things we can touch and see and weigh and measure and examine. It's real. It happened. The Sahaba knew about this. And they, they, they were really doing things and we, we had the physical evidence uh, that, that that for us today is very impressive. I think Absolutely, Paul and I can t I can tell you one thing with absolute confidence and certainty that if the Sahaba did not touch these coins Tabi'in people who mm. saw Sahaba with their own eyes definitely mm. touched these coins because the ones who were striking the ones who were striking these coins in the Byzantine territory Let's say in the case of the dinar because most dinars were minted at Damascus, the city of Damascus. And there were many Sahaba living in Damascus at the time. So these people who were making these dyes, the dye makers and the coin makers, 
people who were working to to create these coins or to strike these coins they could see sahaba walking around i'm pretty sure when it was time for prayer these very die makers and coin strikers would go to the masjid the umayyad mosque and pray there because that was the central central mosque of damascus so they would go and pray and they would come back to their work right they would see the sahaba in the first in the in the in the first row in the front row so these people who struck these coins would definitely have seen the sahaba if not the sahaba uh, you I, know touched this is very special because i i i've had the huge privilege of speaking to dr sidki who's, uh, who's a, a leading expert on chronic manuscripts and and he he told me and he's obviously said this elsewhere that we now have the actual physical manuscripts dating right back to the time at least the sahaba if not to the prophet himself and so we now have all the material evidence that it's not disputed anymore it's been carbon dated scientifically verified open to public inspection all of the Quran goes back to the time of the Prophet. We now have coinage that go back to at least the time of the the, the people who succeeded the uh, the companions of the Prophet. So it's all coming real. It, it's it's you know and open to investigation and public examination. I like that. Absolutely, absolutely. And and the, this evidence is overwhelming. Okay, yeah. the Quran is a public text. Mm. When the very disciples of the Prophet of Islam are walking around, okay. Uh, uh, I mean, maybe as uh, old men, they are elderly, but they are they are alive. They are the authorities mm -hmm. who are approving the text on these coins. The coins are uh, the most common thing that would have been used at that time. Everyone needs money. Everyone everyone uses money, you know, to buy anything, uh, even basic necessities. You need money, and mm -hmm. on that money, you you had uh, Islamic formulas. Moving on to the next coin, which is a very interesting coin again. Um, we are told in the history of Islam about the Kharijites, okay, the Khawarij, uh, a group of extremists who would yep. often rebel against the authorities of the time, starting from Ali bin Abi Talib and going all the way up to the Abbasid period. Okay. And today, we, we still have remnants of them today, of course, but that's a different <laughs> subject. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, we still have to put up with that kind mm. of stuff today, this day, this day and age. Uh, the, uh, amazingly, the remnants okay all the traces uh, of behavior still exist very much okay the khawarij uh, were not extreme just because of the theology but there was a behavior a, mm. a pattern in the behavior which identified them as khawarij because how did the prophet identify them mm. they will be very rash mm. very brute very rude very quick to judge okay mm. and very quick to attack you right mm. look around you in the Muslim world, unfortunately, we have many people who have these tendencies and these characteristics. They will judge you very quickly. They will attack you. They're very rude, very uh, rash. They're very rude to the scholars in particular. They won't respect any authority. They won't respect any scholarship. They will degrade you and 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 basically throw throw you under the bus immediately. Right? This this is what stood out about the Khawarij. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to introduce you to a Khawarij coin actually minted oh, by wow. the Kharijites, right? No, I didn't and know that. I didn't know this sort of thing. How extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. 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 So the Kharijites for some time temporarily took the city of Kufa in oh, Iraq in, Iraq in the year 128 Hijri when the Umayyads were facing sharp decline, politically speaking. The Abbasids were coming up. The Abbasid revolution was on the horizons, right? And this is when many opportunistic uh, groups, they started mm. to rise and they started to take territories until the Abbasids came on, uh, came later on and they, they, they ousted all of these uh, minor uh, entities and groups. So Kharijites mm. took the city of Kufa in the year 128 Hijri. What you can see on the edge up here, it's a very tiny writing. There mm. is that Kharijite slogan, even oh. though it's taken from the Quran, but it is misinterpreted, misrepresented by the Kharijites for their ends. For their theology, so the the slogan is La Hukma Illa Lilla. Ah, yes. La Hukma Illa Lilla. Basically, there is no governance except for Allah. Mm -hmm. Okay, the the principle is correct, no doubt. The principle we don't debate, but the way it was applied by the Kharijites to attack mm -hmm. the authorities of the time, Muslim authorities of the time, was mm -hmm. completely misplaced, and yeah. this is why they were called the Kharijites. So you can see where my finger is, my top finger, this one, you can see on the edge, very small writing, very tiny writing, microscopic, yeah. it's written, La Hukma Illa Lillah. Okay, and then you see you have, the, the, the rest of the coin is very similar to the standard Umayyad coin from 128 Hijri, with Surah 
112 on the back again as okay. as Muhammad. Okay, uh, you can see the surah there, uh, 112 again, and the same formula anti-clockwise taken from 933 surah 9 verse 33, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, this coin tells stories. It tells us history that the Kharijites they took the city of Kufa in the year 128 and they minted these coins. Gosh. Very quickly moving on to one one of my, you know, how can I put it? My, one of my babies, <laughs> like, you know. <yeah. laughs> Is that what you call them? Your babies? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, that's it's right. all coming out now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, so this is an Anglo-Saxon imitation of the gold dinar. Oh, very nice. This is what I've been talking about, Paul. Anglo-Saxon. This is English. This is an English production. Before there was England. Before yes. there was England, <laughs> right? Because this is this was minted somewhere around between the year 774 to 790 ah. CE. Yeah, that's before England. Yeah. When when Offa was ruling the territory of Mercia in current wow. day. Okay, so uh, this is basically an exact copy of an Abbasid dinar minted in the year 157 Hijri uh, by Caliph Mansur in Baghdad. So, so because the Abbasid dinar was the dollar of the day, um, it was the most accepted currency in the world at the time, due to partly due to the quantity of gold, uh, because the gold quantity was so good in those dinars. French and English kings at the time, they started to imitate those dinars for better uh, economic prospects. Yeah. Even um, when they would pay a tax to the Pope, in Rome at the time, they would pay the tax in Mancus, because this is what a Mancus looked like. But Mancus, it's, it's hugely, hugely ironic. So you're saying that, that the people would pay tribute to the Pope, you know, uh, Christian kings, with Islamic inscriptions on them saying there is no God but God. Absolutely. So, not uh, knowing not knowing what they are copying. No, no I, I wonder if the Pope realized that he was receiving tribute, uh, Islamic tribute like that, which actually obviously corrected his faith, you know. Uh, interesting. Imagine if the Pope knew that he is receiving money in tax, mm. um, uh, basically, that has the formula inscribed on it, Muhammad Rasulullah, mm. Muhammad the Messenger of God. Mm. I don't know what pop, what that Pope would think at the time. Even the king, the the the, mm. the Mercian king Offa, or the English king, Anglo-Saxon king Offa, had no idea what the dye makers were copying, because yeah. the dye makers were copying this beautiful Abbasid dinar with mm. some alien strange formulas, not knowing what these formulas actually constitute. And the formula was Muhammad Rasulullah on one side of the coin. On the other side, you have La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. There is no God except Allah and he alone deserves to be worshipped. So, so uh, today we call this creeping sharia, of course. You get something, oh, creeping sharia. <laughs> but it's one of the great rich ironies of history that Christian tribute to the Pope was given in the name of the Prophet of Islam. And I, I think it's a delicious irony. Yes, absolutely. And and uh, what, what's more amazing is that these coins were minted in Carolingian France and Anglo-Saxon Britain. I mean, you can see the other side here. Again, it's crudely copied, uh, but it's a good job. Uh, for, for those guys who didn't know the Arabic language, they, they have done an amazing job. You yeah. can't easily tell that this is an imitation. You really have to look very carefully and closely to see the, the errors in spelling. There are a few wows and few alifs missing, right? So, so, so they were copied. Uh, you're saying that this is, was this manufactured in, in what is today France? You mentioned the Carolingian. No, no, this, no. this one, to, in my opinion, this one was produced in Britain. The, they were there were those produced in France as well. So, right. so we have two two territories where these coins were produced: Carolingian France or yeah. Italy, Northern Italy, uh, right. or Britain. Right. Th these imitations, these particular imitations of the Abbasid dinar, were only produced in Britain and Carolingian France or Northern Italy. I'm just enjoying the irony there um, of, of France, or what became known as France, producing Islamic coinage, <laughs> uh, particularly, uh, you know, recent history of, of France. Again, I I Islam is there, right? You know, even before what we call France, Islam was there in terms Absolutely. of coinage. This, yeah. this is Charlemagne. This is when Charlemagne was ruling uh, France. And, uh, and the irony is that Charlemagne's grandfather, Charles Martel, had defeated 
uh, one of the Muslim incursions in France, and later on, his own grandson was minting coins taken taken from the Abbasids, uh, which is which is very strange. Okay, mm. so we have now covered Paul uh, successfully, hopefully, uh, eight coins. Okay, oh, one more finally, mm. the last coin I would want to discuss with you very quickly to to uh, possibly uh, uh, surprise our viewers about how important coins can be historically speaking. This is a penny from the 18th century, 1700s, that depicts an African slave right. in chains. I don't know yeah. if you can see it. Yes, yes. Okay, now you can see it, right? Very, very distinctive. Very and distinctive. If, you, if you read clockwise from five o'clock, no, sorry, seven o'clock, it says, am I not a man and a brother? A right. very, very well-known 18th century figure. Yes. Uh, the abolitionists who were working hard in 18th century Brit Britain and Ireland, mm -hmm. they had issued these pennies as a propaganda tool yeah. to, to, to disseminate the, their message in the wider society because penny mm -hmm. was the most used coin or denomination in Britain at the time. So mm -hmm. they came up with this genius idea to put their propaganda on the coin Right. Uh, to abolish slavery and mm. on the other hand you see uh, two hands meeting or shaking mm. okay and the, uh, and the message on the coin basically is that uh, uh, slavery and oppression will cease to exist Gosh. okay it says slavery and oppression will cease to exist so this is something people can take pride in people who come from Britain that this is the kind of work some British human rights activists in the 18th century or abolitionists uh, yeah. who were essentially human rights activists, right? Uh, yeah, these are yeah. human rights activists. Mm -hmm. So they produce stuff like this to disseminate their message. So you would see this figure of an African slave in chains on pottery, on, right. on cutlery, on spoons, on cups, on mm -hmm. all sorts of things, on, on carrier bags. They wanted to show the world, in particular in Britain, they wanted to, the people to see that this is what we are dealing with. This is what we are doing to mm. Africa. Okay, so this is an African in chains who is. Saying, what, what was the date of that again? Do you think this is eighteen to seventeen eighties? Oh, seventeen. Oh, seventeen eighties. So seventeen eighties. Right, okay. okay. Just after the American Revolution, then, in, and uh, just yeah, before. Just before the, French Revolution, the American Revolution. even even during the French Revolution, seventeen eighty nine. So I mean, was that was that actual coinage in circulation as such? Or yes, that, yes, right. absolutely. This was legal tender, legal oh, really? tender in the yeah. sense that this was uh, exactly the same as the the already uh, uh, used penny, the penny that was being used in Britain at the time. And uh, then on the rim, I mean, it's very difficult to show you that. That the, on the rim, very thin writing. It is written that this penny is or can be used in Dublin, Cork and Belfast. Gosh. Okay. And that's on the rim. When oh. I say the rim, I mean the edge here, here. Yeah. That's yeah. written on the edge that this penny can be used in Dublin. I don't know how they wrote that in the 18th century, how they <laughs> managed to do that. It's just phenomenal. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so this is it. These are my nine coins I wanted to share That's with you. Extraordinary coins. I mean, we've gone from the ancient Greeks. Yeah, there was the first coin that might have been even handled by Plato himself, the father of Western philosophy, you know, who, who was the disciple of Socrates and who was the teacher or mentor of Aristotle, who then taught uh, Alexander the Great. And we saw Alexander the Great's dad on one of the uh, Philip of Macedon. Uh, and then we went on to um uh, constantine the emperor constantine in the fourth century who of course gave us the nicene creed and the earliest complete bible we have during the the, the 350s at that time in the british library and then we went on to uh the abbasids and the the Quaridge and 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 so on and right up to the anti-slavery uh coinage we've just seen it's absolutely extraordinary history in the real sense that history can be told as you have done very successfully adnan a history can be told in amazing coins that it's not just in books that there are physical artifacts we can look at quantify measure date in our in our own hands and that is an extraordinary way of experiencing history rather than just reading about it in books is what i normally do but you, you actually have physical remnants of history in your house which is quite amazing really i i don't actually store coins in my house just oh, you don't? 
because uh, <laughs> we're going to burgle you later probably <laughs> yeah I, I i don't i don't um uh, okay. if if there's anything valuable i have a uh, storage space uh, for that and uh, i don't i don't take, keep anything valuable I don't know, because someone might have thought right we'll pop around to adnan's and nixon um, yeah. coins. Okay. I mean, uh, this is you see i'm a numismatist i i i, I have been uh, doing this for for many years uh, yeah for decades and this is the first lesson any expert numismatist will teach you that any valuable coins uh, are like a treasure so you don't keep them uh, in your house you know or any so you, you have special storage spaces for those things and this is where so it's like a fraternity you know we have numismat numismatic fraternity so they uh -huh. share knowledge information with each other so we get together and we 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 store our uh, valuable things in a, in a in a specific place no is, don't, don't, don't tell us it's not it's not a hole in your garden i have it's not you dug a deep hole <laughs> no, it's not it's okay. not it's not anything like that no no okay. absolutely i've got one final, final question i really want to ask you if i could grant your wish or your wish could be granted adnan the one coin in the world that you would love to own love to possess as your own what would it be what, what's that coin that you really really want do you think oh that's a very good question man uh there are few but if you if you were to give me a choice to own mm. one coin mm. uh i would say standing caliph oh. standing standing caliph is a coin minted by abdul malik bin marwan as an experimental measure okay uh, this was this was before he minted his 77 hijri dinar okay as i mentioned earlier the first prom properly completely islamic dinar was minted in the year 77 but yeah. abdul malik uh, was experimenting uh, with different coins, uh, different designs before he came to this particular design we saw today, right? Mm -hmm. So he minted few coins with different designs. One of those coins was he standing himself uh, as the caliph depicted on the coin with the sword, okay? And around him is the formula La ilaha, la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la, okay? So you see a man with a beard, with long hair, with a thobe, with a lavish thobe, and with the, with the sword. So if yeah. you Google standing Caliph Dinar, you will see the coin that I dream to have one day, uh, inshallah. Inshallah. Well, I hope you do, because um, then you could talk about it endlessly on TV programs, and it'd be wonderful. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You never know. And it's very costly, by the way. It's, 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 it's extremely difficult to get hold of. It's mm. been sold in auctions for, for hundreds of thousands of pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, extraordinary. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's absolutely amazing. Well, thank you so much indeed, Adnan. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, looking at these amazing coins and, and how they show us real history. This is not theoretical. This is actual reality. And uh, uh, it's such fantastic. So uh, thank you very much. Long may you continue to collect and educate us about the significance of coins and history to bring it really, really bring it to life in a way which we can't really do just through talking about the past. So um, I think you're uh, what you're doing is absolutely fascinating and I know it's hugely popular and uh, I bumped into you at Speaker's Corner last Sunday and a steady stream of people coming up to you saying, oh, I thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. It was um, uh, and very embarrassing for you, I'm sure, but people are obviously showing their appreciation for how much they've learned from you and continue to learn and long may that continue, inshallah. So um, inshallah. thank you very much. Okay, well, until next time. Thank you very much, Adnan. Thank Take you. Care.